אנחנו שמחים מאוד לארח את, את יורי סלוזקין במכון ון ליר. יורי סלוזקין הוא יליד מוסקבה, שם באוניברסיטת מוסקבה הוא למד ספרות ובלשנות רוסית. לאחר הלימודים עבד כמתורגמן במוסקבה, מוזמביק וליסבון. את הדוקטורט שלו קיבל ב-89 באוניברסיטה של טקסס, וב-92 הוא הגיע לעבוד בברקלי. היום יורי סלוזקין הוא פרופסור להיסטוריה וראש המכון ללימודים סלאביים, רוסיים ויורו-אסיאתיים באוניברסיטת קליפורניה ברקלי. בין עבודותיו החשובות אזכיר את ספרו על העמים בצפון רוסיה ומדיניות רוסית כלפי עמים אלה, החל מהמאה ה-17 ועד תקופת סטלין. ספר זה מבוסס על עבודת הדוקטורט של יורי. אזכיר גם את מאמרו, אני בטוחה ידוע לחלק גדול מכם, המאמר ממש פרדיגמטי בעיניי, העוסק בפענוח של מדיניות סובייטית כלפי הלאומים והתודעה שנוצרה כתוצאה ממדיניות זו. המאמר נקרא ברית המועצות כדירה משותפת, או כיצד קידמה המדינה הסוציאליסטית את הפלורליזם האתני. ספרו האחרון של יורי, העידן היהודי, יצא ב-2004 בהוצאת אוניברסיטת פרינסטון והפך לרב מכר אקדמי ממש. הפעם מבטו המחקרי של פרופסור סלוזקין הופנה לבני הלאום היהודי ברוסיה. מאז יצא הספר, כבר לפני כמעט שלוש שנים, הוא לא רק זכה בפרסים רבים, אך גם זכה לדיונים ביקורתיים סוערים מאוד באירופה, בארצות הברית, ברוסיה. והיום, מאתמול בעצם, לראשונה אנחנו דנים בספר הזה במסגרת קבוצתית כזאת ופומבית בישראל. הספר הוצג אתמול במסגרת ההרצאה הפומבית שנתן יורי אתמול, והיום, ועכשיו אני אעבור לאנגלית. Um, I would like to welcome all the participants at the second day of the debate on the Jewish century by Yuri Slozkin and to open these some uh, maybe personal remarks. In the mid-80s, when I was a teenage girl in Leningrad, I used to visit my grandparents in the sanatorium for the party veterans there they spent every summer. This status of party veteran was given to those who had over 50 years membership in the Communist Party. My grandmother was especially proud of me, and every time I came, she took me to the dining room of the sanatorium to meet her comrades. At that stage, I was newly informed about my Jewish affiliation and was looking for the meanings to that empty signifier. The fact that the absolute majority of the old people who sat in the dining room were Jews was a significant discovery for me. Another discovery was that I found out that my grandparents converted their names. She had been Haya and become Anya. He had been Motl Israelovich and become Matvei Ivanovich. Thus, for me, Yuri Slozkin's book is very much about them. But the book is also about my other grandfather, who never was a party member. He made the whole journey from the small shtetl in Belarus to Rabfak in Leningrad. Rabfak is a high education establishment for proletarians only. And later to a very senior position at the biggest Leningrad factory. Summarizing his life that witnessed the establishment, the conduct, and finally the collapse of the Soviet reality, he articulated to me an amazing path of his identity conversion. Look how interesting, he said. In the 20s, I was a Lishenitz, person of the wrong class, devoid of basic rights after the revolution. In the 50s, I became the manager of a manufacturing department, Nachalnik Tsecha. And today, I am just an old Jew, Stare Yevrei. Yuri Slozkin's book invites us to search our family biography within the collective history, to locate our own grand grandparents in the drama of the three Tevye's daughters. This is what I did. But the idea of this workshop proposes the opposite direction. Its intention was to use the book's insights in order to examine the present, to put Slozkin's ideas in the context of contemporary Israel. This in order to consider how Slyoskin's thesis contributes to our understanding of this reality and to debate the obstacles and the challenges it encounters.
For example, returning again to my own, to my own uh, family, I ask myself how Slyoskin's book would explain the new setting of, of the old scenario. My father, who used to sign every letter he wrote, Dmitry Lerner, the party member from so-and-so, is now a Jewish immigrant in Germany, compliment, complimenting the necessary Veminian in the old synagogue of Heidelberg. He is also a representative of the Jewish immigrants in the Auslander Committee of the city of Heidelberg. I also wonder how the thesis promoted by the book would explain my brother's Hazarabi Tshuva in Israel and his becoming a shoyhet and a soifer in the Sephardic Orthodox community in the north of Israel. And most of all, I wonder how the book on conversion of Jews into Pushkin's death would explain the nationalist political and civil positions as well as the voting patterns of most of my educated compatriot environment. Here I see the inspiring character of Slyoskin's book. In this sense, it is a book that is not only good to think about, but also great to think with it. I would like to welcome all the participants and to thank at this opportunity Van Leer Institute for facilitating the invitation of Yuri Slozkin. I would like to express uh, my gratitude to Ifat Weiss, Rivka Feldhai, Yuda Shinhav, Dmitry Shumsky, Yoni Garb and Shulamit Laron for their enthusiasm and intellectual support. Thank you very much. So, good evening to everybody. About five years ago, a few university professors with some of their students, together with other non-university academics, came here into the, one of the old rooms of this building, determined to convince the authorities that Russians in Israel was a legitimate topic of study and research. Not everybody happened to agree that here was a subject worth investing in. I happened to be the initiator, initiator of that group that met regularly afterwards and produced a fascinating discourse, of course saturated with tensions, around the themes of Russians in Israel, about the prehistory in Soviet Russia, the experience of standing at the gates of Zion, the multifaceted encounters with Israeli society on the personal, cultural, literal, and political levels. I think what we just heard from Yulia is a very small example of what was going on there. I see the meeting today as a direct continuation of our previous work, which attempted to understand in an academic way problems of cultural identities that are never separated from political, social and material realities. I would like to thank Professor Sletskin for accepting our invitation and for coming here, first to give his lecture, but also to take part in this mini conference that may further broaden our horizons in that basically impossible exercise of recognizers, recognizing the strangers who are ourselves. We'll have two, meet, two sessions in this meeting. Uh, and since we are a bit late, I still think we'll take an hour and a half uh, for the three speakers. First speaker will be Shlomo Fischer from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And Shlomo writes on ideology, religion, and education in Israel and in particular, in politics, and in particular, Gush Emunim, that is the religious Zionism, and Shas political and ideological agendas. Each speaker will have about 20 minutes, and then we'll try to take a few questions and go on to the next speaker. The land of Israel stood for unrelenting Apollonianism and for integral, territorial, and outwardly secular Jewish nationalism. That's a quote from the Jewish century, and I'd like to take that quote as the keynote of, uh, of my remarks. I'm not going to explain the key words of polonialism and mercurialism. You have to read the book for that, or the author is here, and he can explain it to you. Um, I trust that they are somewhat intuitive to those who haven't, are not familiar with the material. In this talk, I would like to briefly show that not only that Jewish people adopted an Apollonian character, 
but also how a new Apollonian Jewish religion is emerging here in the land of Israel. I put a question mark in my title because I think that the emergence of Apollonian religion in Israel raises questions about the very notion of Apollonianism and how it is employed by Professor Sluskine. Thus, in the first part of this lecture, I would like to show <coughs> that certain themes that were part of the revolt against Jewish Mercurianism in the early years of the 20th, 20th century, and especially against its cultural ritual embodiment, the Jewish Talmudic diasporic religion, have in the last years of that century, and in the first years of this one, entered the Orthodox Jewish religion itself, and have subtly, and not so subtly, altered its basic fabric. From a rationalist, intellectualist religion suitable for service nomads, specializing in financial and commercial functions, to the religion of a territorially based majority population engaged in protracted and bloody territorial conflict. Um, I will discuss this change in regard to two clusters of this phenomenon. Before I go on, the second part of this lecture will be devoted to the actual, the implications of this analysis for the notion of Apollonianism itself and for certain basic themes in the book. Okay, I will discuss this change in the Jewish religion in regard to, clusters of, to two clusters of phenomena. The first has to do with the transvaluation of the material, the body, and sacred violence. The second has to do with the study of Talmud and the Bible. Um, and that, uh, two educational issues that I would like to discuss here. Okay. I'm going to focus on the first part of this lecture on the thought of uh, one representative figure. I'm not going to dwell on him too much, but somebody that I've done some work on, um, who uh, has given high cultural, theological, and um, darshani and homolytic exposition uh, um, of the new Apollonian religion. That's Rabbi Yitzchak Ginsburg, who is one of the most, if not the most important theologian practicing in Israel today, certainly one of the most original theologians practicing in Israel today. And, um, and then I'm going to go on to some more broader material uh, involving broader groups of people. Okay. Um, the radical step that Rabbi Ginsburg undertakes is that the very materiality of the material body, land, physical material, and nature makes a unique contribution to the consciousness of God. This, this unique contribution on the part of the material, the grossly non-spiritual, is what completes the ultimate religious realization. In the center of Rabbi Ginsburg, I want to give a couple of examples of this type of analysis of the material, of the material and how he transvalues materiality into making it into a vehicle of Jewish mysticism or of the consciousness of God. And probably Yoni will explain about things like that later. In the very center of Rabbi Ginsburg's analysis is the very self-sufficiency of material objects their very whatness, the fact that they exist with a solidity that, as it were, takes itself for granted. Material objects are self-sufficient in themselves. Their ontology, their being, does not seem to depend upon any outside factor. The basis of its existence is from within itself. Under the non-eschatological conditions that, contain, that obtain until the redemption, this very characteristic of the material is what separates it from God. The material is held to be non-godly precisely because of its ontological self-sufficiency. As we have indicated, the base of its, ex of its existence is from within itself. It does not seem to depend upon God or be part of God. It seems to constitute its own in independent dominion. Under conditions of ultimate religious realization, the, the material softens and is allowed to realize that its origin really is in God and that it really is God's material. When that happens, it does not lose its innate quality of seeming ontological self-sufficiency, self but this becomes interpreted differently. The very materiality of nature and matter reflects the absolute whatness of God, the absolute solidity of his being, his absolute thereness, this in theirness in a Heideggerian sense, right? This is in contrast to higher spiritual beings who are sensitive to the utter transcendence of God, but, cannot, but as a result cannot feel his real solid being. Thus, a central aspect of the ultimate religious realization 
is to become aware of God's utter solidity of being through the material solidity of matter. Right? So, um, um, in this context, Rabbi Ginsburg speaks not only of inanimate materials itself, but most importantly, those human capacities which are most involved with the material world. Imagination, spatial sense, sensual pleasure, habit, and instrumental practical activity. These activities which were devalued, these aspects of human existence, which were devalued in spiritualistic, intellectualistic, diaspora religion, become, in Rabbi Ginsburg's thought, um, the basis for the consciousness of the deity. In other words, what we have here on the, theolo- on, on, on the first level, on the th- highest theoretical, theological level, is that materiality itself undergoes a revaluation. This, I'm going to give one more example of this in a myriad of examples that, that Ginsburg um, gives in his various writings. He has 83 uh, items under his name in the Jewish National, in the, in the National Library, um, so he's quite prolific. Um, another example that he talks about is the tendency of materiality towards nothingness. That material, the material tend towards to, 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 to disintegrate, towards entropy, towards stuff like that. Now, Ginsburg here is operating upon or reversing an entire theological mystical tradition which sees God as nothing, not because he's really nothing, but because he's everything. And that's the Neoplatonic tradition of Duns Scotus and people like that. That God is the all, and hence he can't be defined as a discrete object, hence he's the ion, he's the nothing. But Ginsburg is much more radical than this. Rabbi Ginsburg responds to this line of thought by arguing that this conception still preserves God as a being, an all-inclusive being, which doesn't lend, itse- lend itself to differentiation or delineation, but a being nevertheless. Rabbi Ginsburg suggests that God is nothing in a much more primal sense. God is nothing because he includes within himself non-existence in the plain literal meaning. One cannot say of God, argues Rabbi Ginsburg, any predicate such that its opposite would not be true of God. You can't say that God is black and not white. So we cannot say that God exists and it would not be true to say that God does not exist. It is also true that God literally does not exist. Rabbi Ginsburg suggests that the way we can grasp God's God non-existence is, by, is not by reference to spiritual entities such as souls, ideas, etc. These have too much in the way of logic, form, and inner coherence. The way that we can grasp God's non-existence is by reference to matter with its muteness, formlessness, darkness, entropy, its tendency to disintegration. Matter tends to nothing, to non-existence. So here again, in its very anti-spiritual quality, matter ties us in a unique way to God. Now, Rabbi Ginsburg, I'm not going to go into this, Rabbi Ginsburg ties all this stuff to the very materiality of the land of Israel. And the land of Israel is holy precisely because it's material, and it's precisely in the land of Israel that this materiality obtains its spiritual dimensions. Um, And he creates a figure... And he creates a figure of the man of the earth. Now, the man of the earth is the earth, as Rabbi Ginsburg describes, is lowly and humble. It's a sort of liminal space, a space where things lose their previous form on the one hand and gain a new form on the other. The seed rots, but out of it grows a new plant. The body in the grave rots, but it rises in a new form in the resurrection of the dead. The earth is conceived of as a primal, undifferentiated substance. It is the primal mother out of which one sucks one's sustenance. Thus in the thought of Rabbi Ginsburg, as in the thought of Turner and Bakhtin, the very lowly and degraded aspect of the earth, the very culmination of its materiality, as it were, turns into a spiritual principle. Right? And then it becomes, right, and then it achieves a sort of grace in terms of God because it's lowly and humble and becomes attractive and graceful. Now, this is a theological trope for a reality, for a sociological reality, which is developing more and more um, um, in, on the West Bank, um, and that's, of course, Anshay Agvot, hilltop people, hilltop youth, right? 
Um, the figure of the man of the earth does have features in common with the hilltop youth. The hilltop youth, or men and women of the outposts and the legal settlements, do in fact have a countercultural and anti structure ambience about them. Their lifestyle entails a, withdraw- entails a withdrawal from modern bureaucratic structures and technologies. Many of them farm organically. They tend to wear homespun clothes, noteworthy for their simplicity, and build their own homes from materials locally available. Very many of them eschew electrical sources of energy using wind or solar power, right? Some of them, not all of them, some of them are actually not within the official bodies um, that, settle, that, that, that sponsor settlership on the West Bank. Some of them are. Um, but they all have this very highly material, highly countercultural, highly anti anti-technology, anti-modern, anti-rationalist ambience about them. Now, the other thing about the hilltop settlements is that they are located deep in territory that is densely populated by Palestinians and that they are in constant local and bloody conflict with them. So here we have a situation which, as it were, is engineered for violence. Now, this violence is also... Not accidental, but I would, but I would uh, suggest um, part of the basic ideological, cultural, and theological thrust. And here we find this, again, amplified and explicated in a remarkable document writ- written by Rabbi Ginsburg called Kuntres Baruch HaGever, which basically is a theological defense of the massacre of 29 Muslims praying in the Mosque of Abraham in Merat HaMachpelah, in Hebron in 1994, um, explicated and uh, um, um, defended um, by Rabbi Ginsburg. Now, at the center of this, the center of this theology, um, which defends this massacre, is the notion of revenge. And again, revenge is valorized precisely because it is natural and material and um, um, of the natural world. Right? At the center of his argument, what he claims to be the heart of the matter, Leif Ha'inyan, Rabbi Ginsburg places the notion of revenge. For Rabbi Ginsburg, revenge is above all natural. This description of revenge as natural connects it with two central attributes. The first is that a product of nature... And the, sec- and the second is that it's substantial, solid being, right? Revenge is an affirmation of my own solid being in its most material aspect. Revenge is standing on one's own being and not allowed to be denied or negated. Hence, it intrinsically involves family, flesh and blood, constitutes the most material of, of human connections. Right? Because of this, revenge ultimately involves that process which we have discussed at length above of connecting oneself to God through the very materiality of nature and the materiality of world, uh, uh, a material world. Rabbi Ginsburg is interested in and val- valorizes revenge in its very naturalness, materiality, and as it were, animality. He uses the word chayatiyut. Right? It is in line with his general theology of the material, one can establish connection to God through these very characteristics. Now, in this, in this he's, he's a very, very gifted dialectician, and in this pamphlet, he really has two voices. He has a voice which is much more familiar to us. It's a voice which justifies violence on um, uh, the means, justifies the, the ends justify the means type argument in the name of the collective, in the name of that. He writes about that. That really doesn't interest him. What interests him, what interests him is the Isaac Babel people. What interests him are the Benya Crick people from Odessa, the people, the thugs. And he valorizes Jewish violence by Jewish thugs in the context of abstracted territorial conflict. He's not interested in violence, which is Al-Kiddush Hashem, for sanctification of the name. That's familiar. We know about that. It's less interesting. What's interesting is to take violence as a product of of sheer materiality, of sheer thuggishness, sheer amaratsut, the ordinary, and he talks about valorizing the violence of the am ha'aretz, of the, how shall I say, um, um, the, um, 
craftsmanship, plebeian people, um, um, etc. So, this document, as it were, gives ultimate, and I haven't done full justice to it by any means, as it were, gives the apotheosis of the valorization of nature, materiality, the body, instinct, etc., as passed to God and as the basis of a new type of Jewish religion. Okay. Now, um, recent research has started to identify these same things in classical, secular, anti-religious Zionism. Recent researches such as have begun to discern in the work of such thinkers such as Berdyshevsky, Klatskin, and Adi Gordon the idea that ultimate personal, spiritual, and even religious fulfillment or realization can be achieved through activity in and with the material world and, and nature. Right? One Zionist thinker in whom this tendency is marked is Mikhail Yosef Berdyshevsky. Recent writing on Berdyshevsky has drawn attention to his short story, The Red Heifer, in which the act of slaughtering the cow by the gross, crude, and earthy butchers is celebrated as an act of pagan yet genuine religious fulfillment that is superior to the spiritual values of normative rabbinic Judaism. Bernashevsky, in his essays, has reflected upon the relative superiority, superiority of the cult of sacrifices to the spiritual religion of the prophets and the rabbis. Right? And uh, he has a quote here that the blood of calves and the sacrifices of uh, goats and sheep are uh, uh, tied man to nature, and the Kohen is the priest is superior to the prophet. And of course, the firstborn is superior, Habcho is superior to the priest. Right? So, um, um, the earthy, rooted, natural, the muscular, crude, Amaaretz, plebeian, who positively represents a Judaism that is earthy, rooted, natural, and healthy, in contrast to the spirituality and non tangibility of the Torah scholars, is a familiar figure in the Hebrew li literature of the period of the Zionist awakening. So, what we have here is we have themes that were once the property of a revolt against. Jewish religion have, as it were, entered the Jewish religion itself and become the basis for a new religious spirituality, um, not a new orthodox religious spirituality. Now, this has, this has, has um, um, expressed itself in two remarkable controversies which have taken place in the past couple of years. One has to do with the problem of the study of Talmud. Now, Talmud is the, is the, is the very heart of the traditional Jewish educational system. And, and um, um, the inability to get people, uh, to get kids to study Talmud or to take it seriously, um, um, to be proficient at it, to, to etc., um, has been a cause of much consternation in the last couple of years and has even um, um, occasioned the government commission sponsored by the Ministry, Ministry of Education to look into why Talmud study doesn't is not successful uh, either on the high school level or even on the high yeshiva level. I mean, my people prefer, people prefer um, um, to study Jewish thought or Bible or stuff like that. Now, it seems to me that this is an expression of exactly what we've been talking about. I mean, Tal Talmud in its more, um, um, right, you know, the halakhic Jewish religious culture of the pre-modern period was uniquely suited to a despised minority specializing in financial, commercial, and craft occupations. Um, right? This, you know, first dietary, commensable sexual and marriage restrictions confirmed the Jews in the minority and foreign status. That's, of course, detailed uh, uh, in the book. Um, and secondly, it's intellectualist orientation and the value that places upon the life of the mind and the spirit, uh, right, has an elective affinity with the rational calculation and abstract reasoning that characterize the life of Jews as financial and commercial specialists. <laughs> However, such a religious culture is not at all appropriate for Jewish territorial nationalism, right? Uh, um, the intellectualist, spiritualist, abstract spiritual orientation of traditional halakha, Jewish halakha culture is radically unsuitable for a movement that is focused upon grounding Jewish life in a national territory and upon the autarkic requirements of a modern state. Okay, so at the beginning, what you had was that people like Bertoshevsky, Gordon, and Klatskin throughout Talmudic religion. What we have now is a reinterpretation of religion, right, uh, with the sort of Leibniz philosophy, which takes place inside, inside the Jewish religion. And, um, uh, and that expresses itself in the inability to study Talmud. There's just one more controversy that I could very briefly mention, and that's the controversy of 
what's called in Hebrew, Tanakh Begova Ha'enayim, which is how do you study, how do you study uh, Bible, right? Now, this refers, Bible at eye level, which is Tanakh Begova Ha'enayim, right? This refers to construing the biblical text in a way that remains very close to the plain sense of the words, and more importantly, gives a lot of verisimilitude to real life. That is, life is quotidian, individu- quotidian individuals live it and experience it. This approach is contrasted with an alternative method in which texts that are problematic from a moral or religious point of view are interpreted in such a way that the problem is rectified. Right? The prime case here, of course, is David and Bathsheba, right? where, where in David and Bathsheba, either if you take the, do you take the biblical text seriously in that David did sin, or do you rely upon Talmudic traditions that say he who says that David sinned, of course, is mistaken, and there are uh, exegetical interpretations of that. Now, the point is, is that for contemporary, many contemporary young Israelis, young Orthodox Israelis, the value of the Bible is precisely that it shows an inner-worldly reality of politics, general, je- jealousy, rivalry, war, violence, love, and sex, and fills this reality with religious and divine meaning. It's not, in other words, it, what the, what's needed religiously is to talk about violence, love, and sex, and not, and to fill that with religious meaning, and not to reinterpret the Bible such that it elides all this love and sex and violence and war out of it. Okay, so that's the other controversy, and that's becoming... Now, I'd just like to make one final remark. I think my time is about, about to... Okay, and that is that the new religiosity uh, with its very emphasis upon particularism and upon the body and upon the particular thing is radically anti-universalist. Now, I think that that has, it tends to deny non-Jew citizenship rights, certainly political rights. Um, It differentiates explicitly uh, between the value of Jewish and non-Jewish life and it tends to accentuate the particularistic aspects of Judaism. Now, the question is, what is the connection between Apollonianism and Universalism? And that's a question which I had constantly while reading uh, the Jewish century. And I'd like to put it in these terms, if I may, which is I was very grateful uh, to Professor Sleskine for reviving the old uh, Zambard, Weber controversy about the nature of capitalism, the nature of modernity, and its indebtedness to Judaism or to Calvinism. Um, I think that um, the book doesn't, in a certain sense, revive the controversy and also evades it. Because I don't think that the Weberian case was taken seriously. And that's what I'd like to uh, focus on through the prism of the case study that I just handled now. I don't think that, that it takes the Weberian case seriously. I think that, you know, when thinking about Mercurians, some Mercurians, as Professor Slesgoyne presents them, are clannish, are tribal, have in-group solidarity. And then that, in his analysis of modernity, um, is transferred onto the modern world in the form of nation states, which are basically tribes become larger than primal groups. That nation states retain the particular notion of Mercurianism, so Mercurianism is perfectly translated into modernity. Now, I would like to, I would like to take from a point of view um, of an American Jew who has been perfectly assimilated here for the past 30 years, um, um, I would like to say that universalism I experienced universalism. I think most American Jewish literature, um, Philip Roth in his early days, Goodbye Columbus and things like that, uh, Norman Parharitz in an extraordinarily vulgar book that he once wrote, um, any number of other people experience universalism as an Apollonian trait and as belonging and as belonging as belonging um, to the wasps and to the Apollonian masters of the land. And hence, um, um, and hence, I think that, that, and that I think was Weber's argument. I think that Weber's argument was that modernity comes from Calvinism because it's a transmutation within Apollonianism. 
And that's what sort of thinking about Jewish Apollonianism, which I think is not fully modern Apollonianism because it's missing the universalist element, and that I think that, um, that that's the, the Weberian argument. I mean, what, what happened to me was that I, I asked myself, what would be the alternative to Professor Sleskind's account of modernity? And the alternative is, in fact, the Weberian account, especially as understood by people like Habermas and, and Talcott Parsons, who I take more seriously than just being a reflex of the Cold War. And, um, and, and that is, is that Apollonianism contains within itself this ability not to make exceptions, to apply things universalistically, to apply things, and that comes out of the very notion of Apollonianism, especially as a majority people does not seek for exceptions, does not make exceptions for itself, applies things, as it were, universalistically, and, that, and then hence I think that um, that um, the notion has to be um, somewhat at least reconsidered. I don't know if, it, if it, I would want to throw out the entire analysis offered in the Jewish century, but to reconsider the analysis and to make Apollonianism and Mercurianism into richer concepts than are presented in this extraordinarily interesting uh, uh, book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shlomo. And I think we shall go immediately to Jonathan Garb's uh, discussion and then discuss both papers and the response. So Jonathan Garb is from the Department of Jewish Thought in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and his second book, Studies in 20th Century Kabbalah, will appear in English at Yale University Press next year. Jonathan, please. Periodization in general and division into centuries in particular are fictions, but necessary fictions. I think that one can look at something like uh, Barbara Tuchman's <coughs> Distant Mirror on the 14th century to realize how valuable periodization can be if one, one wishes to understand the thought of a century. Um, especially with regard to the 20th century, I think that people, men, and, and towards the end of the century, 20th century, they became people, uh, of the 20th century thought of themselves in those terms. That is, they thought of themselves first as men and then as people of the 20th century in explicit uh, terms. Now, in this uh, fascinating and controversial book, uh, Professor Yuri Sloskin uh, has powerfully brought forth one of the most important and intriguing features of the 20th century, and that's the salience of Jews <coughs> among economic and political, sometimes uh, cultural elites, and the prominence of the image of a Jew. And that's, I think, very important, the image of a Jew and the Jewish state in uh, cultural and political discourse, even if it's in a negative fashion. And in this brief offering, I wish to embellish this thesis by examining the relationship of the, this process described here with another important feature of the last century, the remarkable renaissance of mystical thought, especially during the early and the later parts of the 20th century. Now, the present uh, upsurge of mythical, mystical, and magical discourse and practice, which is often dubbed the New Age, is now recognized by many scholars to be one of the most important social, cultural, and no less important economic developments of the later 20th, later 20th century of recent decades. However, this ever-proliferating network of practices, groups, and products can be seen also as a more powerful form of a mystical ferment around the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. And as shown in a forthcoming book based on a PhD thesis by uh, Zorma Orr, the earlier mystical trend of the beginning of the century affected several thinkers and writers who are very much associated with, the, uh, with Jews and the image of a Jew, also in uh, the Jewish century, um, such as, for instance, Franz Kafka was very much influenced by this mystical awakening. Now, turning to this contem the contemporary New Age, one can readily add this domain of mysticism, of popularization of mysticism, to the, one of the, to the numerous and persuasive itineraries of Jewish presence that we find in a book. As a primarily middle-class phenomenon, the New Age counts a uh, disproportionately amount of Jews amongst its echelons, especially even leadership levels. For instance, to, we'll take one example of the prominence of Jews in American Buddhism has led to the coining of a new term, especially in California, uh, Jubu or Jewish Buddhist, and these figures such as Allen Ginsberg and Joseph Goldstein and Ezra Baida, one can hear it in the names already, Anne Waldman, uh, etc., are extremely prominent in, Jewish, uh, in, in Buddhist leadership and writing. 
Now, also the Jewish state is a very important hub in the global New Age market. Israel is a major exporter and importer of New Age writings, seminars, products, and celebrities. Finally, when speaking of the Jewish century as a mystical century, one cannot but consider the vast impact of popularized Kabbalah and the success of the Kabbalah industry in enlisting international celebrities in its promotion. Findings tell you very well of those of the economic historian Svi Eckstein, formerly of Tel Aviv University, now of Bank of Israel, a typical move. Uh, and Eckstein has showed in several detailed studies that the move towards a text-centered culture after the destruction of a temple enabled the Jews to cash in on higher rates of literacy and to thrive in urban settings. So Eckstein has described the almost obsessive focus on Torah study following the destruction as extremely profitable long-term economic investment. Now, one of the most interesting parts of Eckstein's research is the finding that Jewish identity almost immediately declines in one generation in rural settings, and we, we see that in the very high conversion rates amongst rural Jews in Eastern Europe in the modern world. And uh, if we, so if we go back to Jewish mysticism, I want to situate Kabbalah in this wider move. By replacing the early uh, topocentric orientation towards the temple, with a higher temple, a spiritual or supernal or, or mystical temple, as shown in Chaviva Padaya's masterly study, the Kabbalah played a major role in the transition from a localized to a textual and vast global, more global culture. Furthermore, through the myth of Torah as a cosmic entity, the Kabbalists not only created a very rich and sophisticated world of learning contained in tens of thousands of volumes, but also provided a framework for other forms of intensive learning as in the Lithuanian yeshiva world, many of whose graduates were among the founders and luminaries of Hebrew University. Though Kabbalah was usually not part of a curriculum in the yeshiva, uh, Lithuanian yeshiva world, it was founded on a Kabbalistic myth of a cosmic value of Torah study as in the 19th century classic Nefesh HaChaim, which describes constant and prolific creative learning as essential for the very survival of the universe. This work also inspired another Jewish success story, Emanuel Levinas, who in the context of a discussion of Israeli politics exclaimed, our books are dearer to us than life itself. In this light, especially in, in the context of what Levinas said, uh, the neglect of education, both basic and higher in contemporary Israel, as a consciously Apollonian state, and the best place to see the Apollonian nature of Israel is in Shol Chernichovsky's Hymn to Apollo, the valuation of nature, and uh, essentially one could say of Amaratzot following Shlomo, of uh, plebeianism. Uh, this can be seen as a reversal of orientation of many centuries. And one of the many directions one can take the seminal uh, work is to consider the social psychology and ethics of a culture which is based on learning and on transnational cohesive networks. I must confess to some disappointment to the absence of a theme of philanthropy in this book. Uh, one can observe it in the United States today, but also in records of other diaspora communities, the Jewish economic might was directed not so much towards further enrichment and influence, which seems to be the focus of a book, but also to social support systems. Thus, to the eliminating lists of prominent Jewish figures found in a book, one can also add lists of Jewish philanthropists and charities. Uh, this consideration should lead us to moderate the uh, essentially correct nexus between Judaism and capitalism. In this light, of all we've said above about the Apollonian state of Israel, I want to uh, read one of the most illuminating of the many fine quotations generously sprinkled around the book, uh, which enhanced the great pleasure of reading, a quotation from David Ben-Gurion, who at least ima in, on an imaginal level is the model of every Israeli leader. And Ben-Gurion writes as follows, We are not yeshiva students debating the finer points of self-improvement. We are conquerors of the land. Now, Ben-Gurion is referring, of course, to the world of Lithuanian Musar yeshivas, who were devoted... As a, main, as a main force in the Lithuanian yeshiva world, they were devoted to combining incisive analysis and profound erudition with training in, social, in fine points of social and ethical sensitivity. And the current moral predicament of Israel, which is described by uh, Yuri Slozkin in terms which are a bit strong, but I think essentially correct, uh, can be ascribed to the choice that Ben-Gurion describes between being an ethical intellectual and being the conqueror of the land. And I think what Shlomo said about violence, religious Zionism, completely tallies with this. So, I think in the book there's more emphasis on the impact this has on Israel's relationship with, the, with its neighbors, but I think we should also consider the profound impact on social ethics and cohesion inside Israel itself. Uh, now, the most interesting case, I think, in the book is actually that of the United States, and this is in a move which can be reinforced by numerous studies. Um, I think that uh, Professor Slozkin has shown that the post-war, at least, imperative of American ethnic identity is to assert one's ethnic identity as part of being American. So to be American, one has to be African-American and Jewish-American. One needs the hyphen. 
So by being ostensibly more Jewish, especially through the religion of the Holocaust, or as Whitley put in the book, victimhood is another form of success, American Jews are becoming more American, and thus more influential in economic cultural life. Uh, at the same time, as we'll see towards the end, the question is, what does this ha do to the Jewishness? If being Jewish is just part of being more American, really. Now, one of the more refreshing flavors in, in the book is the use of popular culture, including cinema. And one can stress that this is, cinema is actually the great cultural innovation of the 20th century. The 20th century can be said on a cultural level to be the century of the cinema. Uh, and the Jews, of course, were, as, as described in the book, very prominent in American cinema, in Hollywood, and of course also in pre-war Europe. So it's appropriate to quote a, a movie, The Believer, 2002, director Henry Bean, in which a yeshiva student, taking to extreme the desire to become a violent Pol uh, Polonian, becomes a neo-Nazi. And when Danny Balint comes to raise money from the right-wing neo-Nazi businessmen, so he, he gets into this uh, speech against the Jews, his usual uh, uh, sale talk, and then one tycoon says, maybe we're all Jews. We're New York, we're all interested in making money, so we've all become Jews. So... The question is, when all successful Americans have become Jewish Mercurians, to what extent are the Jews still Jews? Or is the identity, again, which is more Jewish to become more American, really Jewish? Or in our context, when Kabbalah becomes the all-American product endorsed by irony of ironies, the Madonna, and then sheds itself of any requirement of linguistic or intellectual proficiency or connection to Jewish culture in general, is it still Kabbalah? So, to go back to popular culture, the ultimate recipe of a bestseller in Judaized America is that of Jane Jensen's Dante Equation. And the theme of the book is, uh, uh, it's a good book for flights, uh, Kabbalistic Law Written in Auschwitz. Now, I think I would call it Jensen's Equation. Holocaust plus Kabbalah equals sales. Now, there's only one problem at this Kabbalah, like that of uh, Madonna's teacher Berg, has almost nothing to do with traditional Kabbalah. I wish to conclude by raising an option which is presented by a group which is largely absent in the book, as it's absent in most of scholarly discourse, including in Israel, which is the Haredim of the ultra-Orthodox. Not only do the Haredim preserve a traditional ethos of learning, even though it's also under siege, they exemplify the possibility of a contemporary form of Jewish identity, which even though it's strongly cohesive and particularistic, remains, on decreasing levels, remains Mercurian and transnational. So therefore, as the symbol of at least the second part of the Jewish century, I would nominate the last Lubavitcher Rebbe. As shown in the journalistic but informative work The Rebbe's Army, his Chabad movement combines extremely mobile, extremely global network based on economic power and political influence, including in the Senate and in the non-Jewish world, and one candidate for vice president is, is more or less a fan of Chabad, etc., together for reinforcement of particularistic Jewish identity and a commitment to learning, which even if it's somewhat diluted, is still symbolized by the project of printing the Hasidic classic, the Tanya, even in Antarctica. It's not coincidental that the Lubavitcher Rebbe chose to never even visit the Polonian state. Um, because most of this is really new to me. It's fascinating, it's very interesting, it's most enlightening, but I, I'm not sure what I can add. Uh, speaking of Apollonianism and particularly Babel's characters that you that you mentioned. What's interesting to me is that Bible begins by glorifying uh, Cossack giants, right? The Cossack bodies, Cossack violence, and so on. He had obviously not without serious qualifications. Uh, and then he invents a new Jew, right? The Jewish Cossack, uh, an amoral, violent Jew, the Jewish gangster. Uh, and so on. Um, what's interesting is that that model proved fairly productive, but uh, short-lived. Uh, the Jew, as a literary character in the Soviet literary tradition, uh, was much more important as a commissar, right, as the Bolshevik, because the, the Bolshevik revolution was not, as it turned out, and perhaps as it was meant, in the first place, was not about an Apollonian rebellion. Uh, it was not about an elemental rebellion. It was not about the triumph of the flesh, not about the victory of that Cossack from, the, from Bible's Red Cavalry. Uh, it was about the disciplining of that body, uh, of that Apollonian power, and so on, disciplining by, by the conscious commissar, and so Jews seemed 
to fit the bill, not only because they actually were overrepresented among the commissars, but because the traditional image of the Jew seemed to fit the requirement so, so nicely. Uh, now, Professor Fisher's question about taking Weber seriously. Um, I think I do. I think I do not really have an argument with Weber. I, what I'm trying to say is that there were two paths to modernity, at least, two different uh, ways to becoming modern. One is the one that I essentially accept Weber's description, uh, except that I would add that within my framework, Calvinism is a case of Mercurianism, right? If indeed Mercurianism is about everyone being urban, mobile, literate, articulate, intellectually intricate, physically fastidious, as I keep saying, and occupationally flexible, I mean, that is a part of Weber's argument about Calvinism, and that is one of the, at least one way to look at the um, causes of its success in the new world of capitalism, or perhaps its role in the creation of this new world of capitalism. Um, and then there is, of course, there is this other way to modernity, which seems, if not the opposite of the Weberian scenario, but clearly different from it. When, uh, you, when uh, it's not about everyone becoming an autonomous individual, it's about whole tribes, uh, Jews being uh, foremost among them, uh, making the successful transition from traditional service nomadism to this new world of global capitalism. Speaking of universalism, um, I'm not really sure. It, I suppose it depends on how one views universalism. It seems to me that there's nothing surprising about Mercurians in general, Jews in particular, associating Apollonianism, Apollonianism with uh, universalism, that because what is normal is in some sense universal, right? If you are the exception and you live in the world of, uh, uh, of the general, then by definition that's universalism that you perhaps would like to join or escape from or be separate from to continue being separated from and so on. But it's just as easy to imagine it from the other, from the other, from the other side, right? Because the universalism of Mercurian particularism, as it were, paradoxically speaking, is of course because they are, they are border crossers, they are ubiquitous, they can be in different places at the same time, they are responsible for communicating with the worlds that may be too opaque, too dangerous um, to, to the Apollonians. Uh, so I take your point, but I think that it really is a matter of interpretation, and both seem valid to me, both views, and it's ultimately about what we mean by universalism. And these days, it tends to be identified with global capitalism, uh, and in that sense, it's the Mercurian brand of universalism that seems to have prevailed, but I'm open to other, other suggestions and further discussion. Um, the, the New Age, again, I don't know, I, find, I found your thesis very, very persuasive and very interesting. I'm not sure, I'm going to, uh, I remember it's actually, it reminded me, I went to a movie premiere in uh, San Francisco a couple of months ago. It was a uh, I forget the title, but it's about Jewish identity in America. And uh, it was uh, about the creation of the Barbie doll by a Jewish woman. And, you know, Superman as a Jewish creation, you know, all these American icons, and the Barbie doll, and there's a story of how this Jewish woman, whose name I cannot recall, uh, came up with the idea, with the shape, right, the concept, and so ultimately the icon that it is. No, maybe not as much as it used to be, but still. Um, anyway, and I had, just about a week earlier, I had been uh, criticized by some of my colleagues, uh, including a couple in my, own, in my own department, for being way too vague in my definition of who is a Jew. And, that, and this is, of course, a usual, very 
common American reaction, Jewish American reaction, is that Jewishness without religion, without some form of religious practice or religious identification, uh, is meaningless, or not, I mean, that you lose all sense of Jewishness, and that is indeed true in the particular cases of some of those people. But anyway, just this is, this is uh, yeah, perhaps a silly anecdote, but, you're, but I was reminded of it as I went to see this movie, and there was a whole panel, and the point was that you could be anyone and still be Jewish, and that goes back to your question of, you know, who is a Jew then, and what does it mean to be an American Jew? And one was a popular actor, Peter Coyote, whose real Jewish name I do not remember, but who introduced himself as a Jew boo, a Jewish Buddhist. And then there was a Jewish, Jewish rapper of some kind of Puerto Rican version, I, I'm not sure. But anyway, there were all kinds of Jews. Obviously, there was no religious commonality to what they were. The only one that was there was the tribal, the tribal kind. Um, but to your more specific question about who, uh, you know, to what extent are Jews still, still Jews with everyone becoming, becoming Mercurian, in the United States in particular. I would just, I suppose, repeat what I try to argue in the book, and that is comment on the continued importance of, uh, of the identification with Israel um, and the, the, the uniqueness of the Holocaust, right? And those two things seem, seem to me to be crucial to many American Jews. And uh, I, that it's certainly what I see um, around me where I live, and that those were, and, and some of the responses I have received to the book have centered around those two things, right? The people's reactions to what, to the connection between uh, American Jewry, American Jewishness, and Israel on the one hand, and then the question of how unique the Holocaust is, how important it is to Jewish identity, whether it introduces a new, uh, a, uh, a new way of being Jewish or reinforces some old, old, old ways of being Jewish. Um, and finally, the New Age. Again, this is very interesting. Uh, one question it raises, maybe not directly related to the book, is the usual association of modernity with secularism, right? And here one, insofar as these elements are religious, uh, may be directly related to Kabbalah, may not be. Uh, uh, certain phenomena that are claimed to be secular may not really be secular. And that puts in, in, in doubt the usual identification or association of modernity with secularism. And that's very interesting, and that takes me back to your original point, is this sort of this secular Zionism that was at the foundation of Israel, then eventually, is, if, if, well, if it doesn't lead to, but becomes or forms an alliance, an alliance perhaps of sorts for some people with this new type of religiosity. So, uh, well, thank you very much. And I, again, I'm sorry, I just have to improvise because these are such interesting responses and I would normally need a lot more time to, to think about them and uh, do them justice. So thanks, thanks. Of uh, Rabbi Ginsburg's thoughts of the uh, role of violence in the authentic Jewish material existence that he is uh, arguing for, uh, I was reminded very much of uh, a notion that has been explicated by students of the JDL in its day, uh, the notion, I think Janet Dolgan in her very good book about uh, the JDL, written in the 1970s, I believe, uh, discussed and devoted an entire chapter to the notion of the behemoth and uh, the, the sort of ideology of the behemoth being very much, of course, the opposite of what Mayor Kahana was himself in the 1960s. Uh, and so, there's, of course, there's a dialectical role, but it's not so much the, the dialectical uh, dimension that I'm interested in is to what degree it, do you see Yitzhak Ginsburg, uh, about whom I know nothing biographically, as self-consciously part of that tradition, uh, to continuing the, say, Kahanist religious ideology, or to what degree is he independent, uh, either in his, his self-consciousness or how would you contextualize it? Uh, Yitzhak Ginsburg comes from Chabad. He was American. He comes from Chabad. He comes from Forest Hills, as a matter of fact. Um, but um, 
I don't think that, that Ginsburg himself was connected to the JDL or to, or to Kahana uh, and to that stuff. I think that on the, the two movements intermingle here in Israel, um, and if you want to get um, 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 a real sense of how that, of how that works, um, you, the um, near, uh, Shaul, Shaul Nir's son-in-law who was killed, um, eh? Um, who was killed uh, in, 19, in, in 2004 on a giva outside of Bat Ayin was on the one hand Shaul Nir's son-in-law, Shaul Nir from the Machteret, who one of the people implicated in the, in the murder in the, uh, in, in, in the Islamic College in 1984, um, living a lifestyle of Gvaot and being the head of the chapter of Kahanachai, um, um, in Yerushalayim um, at that time. So you have three groups. You have, you have uh, um, a sort of a continuation of the Machtera tradition on the one hand. You have people active in, in Kahanist groups here in Israel, you know, living in Gvaot, living out the type of lifestyle on Gvaot that, that, um, um, that Ginsburg talks about. So you certainly have an intermingling um, of, of these currents, and of course the American connection here is not inconsiderable. You know, Gam Goldstein, you know, Gam Ginsburg, Gam Kahana, et cetera, et cetera, represent, represent um, um, you know, the American wing of that. I think that in your book you talked about that, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, Reckless Rights. So, um, you know, so you're familiar with that. The disadvantage here, because I haven't read the book, um, which is being discussed, but I'd like to respond to a remark that Professor Slotsky made about universalism. You said it depends on how you uh, define it. Um, I think it's, uh, in, I have found in my, in my historical studies that the predilection towards universalism was very strong among European Jews in the, in the 19th century mainly, <coughs> as a way of getting rid of, the, of their particularity and identifying their Jewishness or their Jewish morals or philosophy or religion with you, the universal um, salvation of mankind, so to speak. Now, I think that this has grown even stronger in the 20th century and what I want especially to respond to is your mentioning the Holocaust in that, um, in that connection. I have found that in America today, the Jews have become more universal than ever in the sense that they identify Jewish or rather reinterpret Jewish values as universal values. For instance, the habit to celebrate the Seder Pesach in mixed groups in, in colleges with the entire faculty present, not as a Jewish holiday, but rather as a symbol of universal liberation. And I found that a great deal of that also um, comes into play with the academic treatment of the Holocaust, not as a, something that is particularly connected with the Jews, they were just the victims, they didn't do it, but rather as a um, uh, universal lesson or anything, or things of that kind. And I find that um, this, um, this tendency of Jews to be universal and to, to be rid of their particularity is getting stronger even in Israel, which is almost a, a contradiction in terms, but it seems to, be, to, have, to have grown for so long um, when, when the Jews were dispersed all over the world and so forth, that, it's even, that Zionism has not succeeded in uprooting it. In fact, it has strengthened. So I take your, take your uh, point. It uh, seems to me what makes Jewish history so interesting, and again, to an outsider like myself, uh, is that so much 
conversation, so many claims are about both universe, the universal and the, and the particular. The Jewish religion being both tribal and ultimately, ultimately global, uh, the Holocaust represented as peculiar, particular to the Jewish experience, yet uh, universal in its uh, significance at the same time. And one can think of more examples of that nature. So I'm not sure that I, I mean, I can see how one could argue that, but I think that what is interesting has always been interesting and remains interesting today about the Jewish experience is the emphasis on both at the same time that is not present to the same degree in Christianity, for example, that sort of begins with, with the universalism, even though, again, one can certainly think of particular things and the way Christianity becomes particularized in various contexts, but I don't think that it is, is central to, to, to other claims, or at least arguably, arguably so. And I think it's both a great strength and one of the, perhaps, the causes of the Jewish prominence in the modern world, and not only the modern world, but also a great, a great danger. This the coupling of both, of both uh, uh, claims. And coming all the way because I've read part of your book, and uh, I think it's very, very fascinating, very challenging, and also for me, very geographical. I'm a political geographer, and I find this way of looking at the world, essentially looking at the differentiation between mobility and stability. Uh, is very enlightening uh, and uh, also very non-Western in a way. So uh, I'd like to just explore a little bit further and from the discussion of Fisher is because uh, he exposed part of the uh, <coughs> problematics of this classification to perhaps suggest there is a missing link or an additional link which is the um, colonial Jew. The colonial Jew is mobile, uh, but with an addition of a state power uh, behind him or her. That creates a, a, a different uh, uh, configuration to your classification, because it is mobile, but yet it cannot be universal. It cannot aspire to universality. It has to aspire for exclusivity. And in that respect, it changes the, uh, uh, the, the scheme of the book. And this, I think, um, in Jewish history, it uh, exemplified a very uneasy meeting of the Jew with the land. Because we cannot forget that Jewishness itself was created outside the land. Right? In the Bible, for example, there are no Jews. The only Jew in the Bible is Mordechai Yehudi, which is in the diaspora. So the consciousness of being a Jew is created outside the land. And then, when we try to, uh, like Fisher showed so well, import theology into the land, we encounter uh, problematics exactly because the Jew has to be mobile but powerful on the land. Um, so perhaps I'm suggesting a, a, a powerful uh, a, a mercurial Jew uh, as another uh, category that may add to understanding the... Uh, our position between mobility uh, and, and stability in the making of Jews. What is it? What is a colonial Jew? What is a colonial Jew? Yeah, okay, fine. Well, uh, <laughs> to, to, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just not sure about this terminology. Well, it, 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 would, it could be the settlers. It could be part of the Zionist project from its inception. It employs Jewish tropes, but it actually makes them, uh, you know, it embodies them into the land. It, 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 it is mobile, but in a different sense. Uh, and it's not universal. So it, it, it adds to the, the first lecture, but, you know, I, I think the, the concept that you, that you throw open is, 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 is very uh, enlightening, very illuminating, but I think it's got the missing link in terms of understanding, you know, the Jews as they assimilate into the West, as they assimilate into the Soviet Union to a degree, there is another vector, if you like, is a non-assimilating mobile Jew. It's very much, you know, the Jew meeting his or her homeland. It's not something elsewhere. And that creates that uh, third type. Okay, so we made it on time. I hope those who are still 
outside will realize that they are missing something, uh, but otherwise will not finish, be able to finish on time. Now the second session is also consists of two speakers. Uh, the first is Tamar El Or from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology in the Hebrew University. Tamar El Or wrote three books on gender, literacy, and religion based on ethnographic work within the different communities. And her books were published in Israel and in the United States. <coughs> Tonight she will speak about the tone, the metaphors, and the arguments, and I would like to call her. So thank you for inviting me, Yulia. Uh, you made me read uh, an outstanding book, uh, and I'm glad to be part of this conversation. Um, my take of the book <coughs> uh, will not relate, as you can maybe see or hear from the title, uh, the tone, the metaphor, the or the metaphors and the arguments. It will not relate to a certain proposition that the book contains to a specific claim or statement, nor will it address the sociology or the history of one of the three Jewish peoples created by the book. Those who reside in the US, those who lived in the former USSR, and those who live in or lived in Palestine, Israel. I would rather relate to the literary side of the book, to its textuality, its literary strategy or literary strategies, or, and maybe in a general way, to its tone, to the music of the book. But since I'm not a literary scholar, but an anthropologist, lacking the tools for such mission, I will address the issue via another anthropologist who was trying to shift the critique of ethnographic texts in this direction. Meaning from what they say, or what we say via an ethnographic text, to how we actually say it. The man is, of course, Clifford Geertz, and the main book, he, of course, he's, he's responsible for, for this literary shift in general, which was influential to other disciplines too, but I will mention just the book in which he demonstrates this method, Works and Lives, uh, um, published in the, in the uh, 80s. I decided to go this way. I, I was not supposed to go this way. I think that Yula invited me to, to or the mandate for, for my participation was the study of, of, of Jews in Israel and to sort of continue the conversation that started here in the previous session, maybe take, a, take it through ultra-Orthodoxy or modern Orthodoxy or Sephardi Orthodoxy, whatever. But when I started to read the book, um, among many other strong sentences that, that come to you on the first page, um, I, read, I, read, I, I read like a paragraph which is, comes out like, like a verse in, in a song, and then comes the, the chorus, chorus line. Um, and it says just one. I would, I would start with it. I could, I could choose another one. Modernization, in other words, is about everyone becoming Jewish. Then comes another verse, of course different, well we're talking about modern poetry, and then comes again a chorus, and it says, the age of nationalism, in other words, is about every nation becoming Jewish. <coughs> now, for those of you who haven't read it, or for just to make it, I will read it again. Modernization, in other words, is about everyone becoming Jewish. The age of nationalism, in other words, is about every nation becoming Jewish. I was amazed. What potency, what clearance, decisiveness, no likely or as it seems, no apparently or it appears that one can say. <laughs> it made me go back and look up the, the thing that maybe made Yulia invite me, as I said, to the conversation, to something similar that I, sort of similar, I say, okay, immediately I say sort of similar, that I wrote in 1998 about modern orthodoxy in Israel, and I found it phrased this way. I said, in many ways, the religious Zionists 
are Israel, Israel's last modernists. In many ways. Only in many ways. Not in all of them. And I thought, what gives an author the power to write about all ways? About everyone, about every nation, about all Jews in here or there. Assuming the author knows that he's not talking about all of them. Assuming that he was exposed to the careful and meticulous tone of academic, especially Anglo-Saxon academic discourse, I gathered that it's not something that's done, you know, that I, I reveal here. I gather that the tone of the writing is going to endow the text its main power. The clear, sweeping, generalizing tone will turn, as I go along with the pages, into the thing, the claim, the message. And of course, without any surprises, it can be, as, as it is here, and I'm... I, I have no idea of the, the conversations that the book aroused elsewhere, but I'm sure that this was addressed. You know, this was criticized. Voila, I'm, I'm repeating it. That historians of modernity, of Europe, historians of Russia, <coughs> and the former USSR, those historians of Jews and Judaism, of immigration, of Zionism, of religion, etc., will be peeking at the little facts, at the other facts, at the other ways, at the not everyone, at the other Jews, at the extra Jews, at those who were not mentioned, at the Jews from the Muslim countries, those who are not Europocentric, etc., etc., all those little details. But I was still interested in the origin of this power of writing, in the ability to push forward a claim to its extremes beyond the facts, to describe another fact, or lots of facts, in order to create a situation, a textual situation of understanding something, a total understanding. When you think of the book that way, you can see why Babel and Sholem Aleichem were called on the mission. Art can create totality. Fictitious worlds can describe realities. Hodl, Chava, Tzaitl, Beile, they can all signify the Jewish destiny, although they never really existed. Who cares? And yet, using this strategy, of course, is not enough. It's a good start, and surely is a beautiful one. The positionality of the author is another condition, or shall we say a precondition, and I here go back to my anthropological uh, attitude. If we go back to Geertz, the question will be, from where does the author in this case look or think or at the end write? Belonging to those Jews? <coughs> but to which of those, do, those Jews? To the Russians? To the former USSRians? To the current USAniks? Californians? Berkliners? Having some traces of effects to those of them living in Palestine or Israel, the Holy Land, knowing them all and belonging to none? Anthropologists have tried to understand those positions and the kind of texts they produce. Usually they tend to follow the political traces. They look for the social remarks, the social traces. But I still found that sticking to the literary might be more useful. The sweeping way of writing breaks down only in one section, only there, things look more complicated, not too clear. And I'm still relating to the very first pages. The first hint to this complexity or possible complexity appears on the second page when the author tells about the outcomes of the collapse of the Russian Empire, Empire's Pale of Settlement. I learned a new word. And I quote, the Jewish migration to the U.S., the most consistent version of liberalism. The Jewish migration to Palestine, the promised land of secularized Jewishness, and the Jewish migration to the cities of the Soviet Union, a world free of both capitalism 
and tribalism. But here comes a surprise. Parenthesis, brackets, and it says, or so it seemed. Suddenly, a reservation. So it seemed? The author ceases to be self-assured of the you ask the most consistent version of liberalism, or Palestine, the promised land of secularized Jewishness. But when it comes to the Soviet Union, the world free of both capitalism and tribalism, so it seemed. And the writer ceases for a moment to be so self-assured historian and a novelist and turns into a careful ethnographer, or maybe to a certain extent, a native. Someone who knows that it is not that simple, or not that flat, or not that way, or not the way it looks, or not the way it can be thought of. The syntax of options, one and two, meaning the option of the United States and the option of Israel, the way Jewish life is portrayed in the USA and Israel resembles, it resembled, it, it, it brought to my mind ethnographies written in the 1930s to the 1960s um, in the United States, a body of knowledge that was then criticized when new ethnography came. The way that, for example, Margaret Mead talked about the Mondogumer or the Arapesh. This is my, you know, this is, that's the, the associations that a poor anthropologist has. So this is the first page that I, 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 was, I was giving away here, just the one that I opened, Sex and Temperament, 1935, Margaret Mead, Chapter 10, The Structure of the Mondogumer Society. The society is not organized into clans as, it, as is the Arapesh, so that a group of related individuals from a permanent unit bound together by common blood, a common name, and a common interest. Instead, Mandagomer's social organization is based upon a theory of a natural state hostility that exists between all members of the same sex, and the assumption, blah, blah, and it goes on. So there is the Arapesh and there is the Mandagomer. These are organized this way. The other ones are organized that way. That's the way that ethnography was written. And, uh, and beautiful ethnography uh, was written. And, and so that's the, way, that's the way the ethnography sounds when he talks about the United States and, it, and, 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 and Israel. But of course it's not the way it is, it is written when, uh, when it, it, it comes or it, it differs uh, strongly when it comes to the, uh, um, uh, the, United, the, the former USSR. The brackets, or the so it seems, will turn into the thesis of the book, will connect the what he wants to say with the way he says it, featuring Hoddle, the lost option, the third and poorly treated immigration from the shtetlach to the cities in, the so in Soviet Russia is at the heart of the book, and the heart demands careful treatment. Does it mean that all of all the nomad could be, all those identities of being be, be it possible to be a nomad or a Jew or a cosmopolitan Jew or an immigrant or an intellectual and all those possible identities of the writer, he's first and foremost a former USSRnik? I dare to say I think so. His Treatment of his grandmother's option is very different than the treatment of the other two, not because he doesn't know the other two or doesn't understand them, but because he knows it differently. He knows it within a certain locality, belonging, commitment, with, some, with that something which ruins modernity at its, at its extremity, with that withinness that can break a solid sound of certainty and calls for art and fiction to rebuild it. When uh, Professor Sleskin warns at the end, and I think I will end with that, um, the end, he mourns at, at, at the end the, the, the collapse of Hoddle's choice, that choice of, in a sense, the option of, of, of not being tribal. We get a very tight text again, one which goes back to the tribal nature of the humankind and gives us the bitter or the sad taste of the success or the sort of success of Zionism or nationalism. No hesitations here again. Everything is clear. There is, this is the way the world goes around, and this is the way families prevail, or tribalism prevail. And this is the uh, page 363 that I have circulated, um, the Requiem 
Uh, it reminded me a lot of the discourse that I'm exposed to about the talk of the end of the kibbutzim. Why the kibbutzim have failed? Because they went against nature. So let's read what happens when you... Um, happens and no human existence involving men, women, and children can abide the abolition of the distinction between keen and non-keen. And with this tragic note, I will end. Very much, Tama. I wonder about the responses soon, but first we are going to hear Dmitry Shomsky. He is now spending the year at the Skolion, the Interdisciplinary Research Center in Jewish Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His dissertation on the origins of binational idea in Zionism will be published or appear soon at Van der Hoek und Ruprecht in Göttingen, Ruprecht. Okay. So, Dimitri, please. Non-Jews non of Jewish origin have never been at the forefront of modern Jewish historiography. Perceived as peripheral to Jewish history, they have they have generally been pushed to the margins of Jewish historiographic, histori historiographic discourse. It is therefore difficult to overestimate the historiosophic importance of Yuri Sloskin's The Jewish Century, which not only recaptures in a fascinating way the forgotten story of the Jews who converted to the Pushkin faith and communism in the Soviet Union, but also convincingly shows that, that what is conventionally perceived as historically marginal within the context of methodological nationalism may, may, may turn out to be at the center of the history of the modern world. Nevertheless, while modern Jewish historiography has never shown a great interest in the Jewish converts to non-Jewishness, the very phenomenon of Jews becoming non-Jews, known in history and historiography alike by the term, assimil by the term assimilation, was for many years perceived by the writers of Jewish history as one of the central forces at, at work throughout Jewish history in general as one of, and as one of the key factors for understanding modern Jewish history in particular. Real-life out-and-out assimilationist figures captured little attention on the part of modern Jewish historiography, but the image of the assimilation as Jew, rejecting his Jewish self, did indeed shape the writing of Jewish history and became one of its major research categories. This took place as part of the dichotomous paradigm that for years guided Jewish historiography, according to which the history of modern Jewry was portrayed as, as a kind of perpetual confrontation between two diametrically opposite trends, assimilation and nationalism. This is clearly valid also for the historiography of Soviet Jewry, while the character of Hodl, the revolutionary daughter of Tavia the Milkman, who along with her descendants from Moscow and Leningrad is placed at the center of Soviet Jewry, of, of history of the Soviet Jewry in Sloskin's books, never aroused particular interest in Soviet Jewish studies. Her image, i.e. the assimilationist image of Soviet Union Jewry occupies a central position among, among the historiographical representations of the Jewry within the framework of the traditional assimilation vis-à-vis -vis nationalism dichotomy applied to its history. Some of you may be surprised to learn that the one who clearly rejected the bipolar presentation of Jewish existence in the Soviet Union was none other than Shmuel Ettinger, more than, three years, more than three decades ago. Contrary to his image as a narrow-minded ideologist, as several critics of the Jerusalem school tend to portray him, Ettinger was blessed with an outstanding professional eye and rather challenged the simplistic ideological division of Soviet Jewry into assimilationists <coughs> and nationalists, or in the terminology of the period of early 1970s immigration into the lost and the redeemed of Dim Venigalim. As he asserts, I quote, in the Soviet Union assimilation of Jews is impossible since the framework doesn't enable assimilation. 
Ettinger rejected arguments that pointed to the absence of a Jewish national culture in the Soviet Union as a proof of Jewish assimilation, stressing that, I quote again, national culture is a function of national awareness. And national Jewish awareness, he argued, is found also among those who show no inclination to immigrate to Israel. However, while over the, past, over the past three decades or so in the framework of what Jonathan Frankel defined in 1992 as a new historiography, more and more students of modern European Jewry followed Ettinger in rejecting the assimilation nationalism dichotomy, recognizing that ethnic and national Jewish awareness may well coexist with the Jews' links to their surroundings and its, its cultures, in the field of Soviet Jewish studies, this historiographical evolution was all but indiscernible. Slotkin's book, which views the history of, the, of Soviet Jewry through the prism of the family-like story of the group of Jewish communists of the 20s and 30s and their, and their <coughs> disillusioned descendants in the late Soviet Union, significantly, significantly strengthens the assimilation is component within the dichotomous meta-representation of this jury, thereby reinforcing the clash between assimilation and nationalism within the general bipolar paradigm. From this point of view, the history of Tsarist and uh, Soviet Russian Jews is portrayed as a gene genealogy of Jewish figures who move between the poles of Jewishness and non-Jewishness and represent dichotomous patterns of Jewish existence in space and time. Complete strangers to the social cultural landscape of the Pale of Settlement and unfamiliar on the most part with the languages of their Ukrainian, Belarusian and Lithuanian neighbors. Tram trampling over the Jewish past, champions of uh, Russian culture and priests of the communist faith in the large cities, cities prior to and following the Bolshevik Revolution. Members of the Russian intelligentsia who suddenly hear the voice of Jewish blood that becomes ever louder from the World War II onwards, but who find difficulty in making sense of it owing to the erased memory of the past. And finally, those leaving the Soviet Union during recent decades to recover their Jewishness in the United States or Israel, thereby marking the end of the Russian part of Jewish history. These are basically the representations of Russian and Soviet Jewry throughout the long Jewish century as unfolded in the book. This type of imagery is problematical because it, it reflects the overt part of the Russian Soviet Jewish experience and thus very easily takes on the appearance of its definitive representation. To be sure, Slotkin doesn't claim that the story of Russian and Soviet Jewry is tantamount to the history of Hodel's branch of the family. On the contrary, he stresses that most Jews in the Soviet Union were not, the part, not part of the communist Soviet elite, identified in the book as Hodel's children. And indeed, according to the author's own inter interpretative approach, David the Milkman had an additional daughter who, like Hodel, but unlike the Zionist Hava and the American Belke, chose not to immigrate from Russia at the beginning of the last century. This is Tatel, who stands for all those Jews who remained in the former pale of settlement in the early Soviet era, but presumably also for the Jews of Moscow, Leningrad, and Kiev, who did not belong to the elite of communist, of the, to the elite communist stratum. However, the author assumes that Seidel was murdered by the Nazis. And so, even if we do find Seidel's children appearing here and there in the margins of the story, of the story it is in fact the communist revolutionary Hodel from Moscow and Leningrad who becomes Tevis' only Soviet daughter in the book. Seidel, however, was not murdered by the Nazis. She may, for example, have fled eastwards with her Kiev family in the summer of 1941, returning to the ruins of uh, her destroyed home in 1944, as did the, the family of my maternal grandmother. Or perhaps she did not return and remained in the Urals, 
like part of her family, or perhaps, if less plausible, she was concealed in the forest by her Ukrainian neighbors, like the sister of my paternal grandmother. Whatever the case, of prime importance is that Seidel was not murdered by the Nazis, at least not the Seidel about whom I speak. Those who murdered her, symbolically speaking, of course, are the historians who continue to ignore her existence, and Sloskin is thus absolutely right in saying that far more was written about Seidel's death than about her life. And it seems that this did not happen by chance, since Seidel's life and that of her children represent just those complex phenomena of Soviet, Russian, Jewish history that cannot be incorporated within sharp dichotomous formulas such as assimilation versus, versus isolationism and non-Jewishness versus Jewishness. This stands in contrast to the lives of Hodel and her children or certainly in contrast to the image of Russian and Soviet Jewish life as portrayed in the lives of Hodel and her children. Thus, in contrast to what this image tells us about the lives of Jews in the Pale of Settlement in Tsarist Russia, Tzaitl was surely fluent in the language of the Ukrainian neighbors. And if Slostin more than once bases his story on the experiences of his family, may I refer once again to the, to the narrative of the distant generations of my own family, such as my maternal grandmother's grandmother from Ternivka near Zhishev, and my paternal great-grandmother from Sinyava in Padolia, who, even after moving to Soviet Kiev, never learned to speak Russian, but spoke only Yiddish and, indeed, Ukrainian. Tzaitl's children, grandchildren, and great-great-children certainly underwent a rapid Russian acculturation during the Soviet era and grew to, to love Pushkin no less than the children of Odell's communist branch. But unlike the latter, most of them remained indifferent towards the mess messianic gospel of the supranational communist ideology. On the other hand, they did not, nor could they, remain indifferent towards the practice of nationalism institutionalizing in the Soviet Union, contrary to its anti-national image propagated by Western Sovietology during the Cold War which has been undermined over the past uh, decade and half by leading researchers in the field, including, of course, Yuri Sloskin himself, the Soviet states institutionalized the personal nationality on the one hand and the ter ter territorial nationhood on the other as two basic social categories. <coughs> this is the institutional crystallizations were by no means empty forms or legal fictions. Rather, this was a true ethnic engineering, pro ethnic engineering project whereby the regime fostered a primordial ethno-national awareness among many of the subjugated nations and established the idea of the mythological bond between the national coll collectivity and its territory of origin in terms of the indigenous nation's exclusive ownership of territory defined as its historic, historic homeland with the individual's ascription to the institutionalized indigenous nation, is assuring him or her of a preferential civic status vis-a-vis -vis citizens, citizens of non-indigenous nations. Faced with the reality of such institutionalized ethnic heterogeneity, it is hard to speak of the centrality of assimilation. And this is perhaps what Shmuel Ettinger meant when he, content, when he contended that the framework in the Soviet Union did not enable assimilation. And in the case of Tzaitl's children, we are not talking just of a somewhat vague awareness of the Jewish blood relationship, but of the preservation of an ethno-symbolic cultural tradition and the continuation of memory of, memory of Tevye's past. We can point to at least one significant channel of preservation of the Jewish national cultural memory. Jewish songs sung in, in Russian spiced with Yiddish words and concepts whose melodies clearly belong to Tevye's Ashkenazi musical heritage. While the figures portrayed in, this, portrayed in the songs not only have Jewish names, but also often clearly display identif identification with the Jewish collective. 
Sloskin is correct in saying that the traditional Stetter humor re-emerged during the late Soviet era as the voice of the Soviet intelligentsia in general. It is, however, most important to understand that for Zetel's children, <coughs> who, cl who clandest clandestinely passed the, cas the cassettes of Ashkenazi Jewish songs in Russian, in Russian from house to house, these pieces of folklore were a unique cultural heritage of the nationality, of the nationality recorded in their internal passports. There is no doubt that in the Odessa ship, his 60th satirical story portraying a ship in which everything falls apart, the Soviet Union's greatest Jewish satirist, Mikhail Zvanetsky, presented an, an allegory of, of the Soviet state in general. But since this ship had a mainly Jewish crew, not to mention the Yiddish intonation in which the Odessa Jew Zvanetsky related this tale on the stage, in the eyes of Tatel's descendants, this was without doubt a Jewish ship, a kind, a kind of imaginary Jewish territory with which they could identify. In any case, the experience of the memory of the, of the past being erased, with which uh, the shock Traisa Arlova is confronted in the 60s in the final chapter of Sloskin book, was completely foreign to Tatel's children. That which she and Hodel's children were unable to see from Gorky Street 6 next to the Kremlin, continued to mold the collective consciousness of Tzaitl's children. If the Ashkenazi Jewish Russian folklore served Tzaitl's children as a substitute, a substitute for, for an institutionalized national cultural identity during the late Soviet period, we can perceive a kind of imaginary Jewish territory in the Jewish informal social networks that developed in what can be termed Jewish sites within the Soviet Union, such as special schools for the science, music schools, chess clubs, technological higher education institutes, and engineering companies with a high concentration of Jews, or even residential neighborhoods with a significant Jewish presence, such as Padol, Padol in Kiev, where my late, gran my late mother grew up, which continued to be a clearly Jewish neighborhood even after the Holocaust. Jewish islands of this type could, of course, provide only a semblance of territoriality, whereas the Jews, seek, the Jews civic status as members of an extra extraterritorial non-indigenous nation was being constantly eroded in relation to that of indigenous territorial nations. But here it is crucial to understand that the very practice, the very practice of civic discrimination against a national group defined as non-indigenous in relation to the indigenous historical landlord was perceived by many of Tzaitl's children as quite natural and even legitimate on the strength of the of the allegedly scientific principle of primordial national historic rights on which it was founded. Despite the lack of an historical homeland in the Soviet Union, the civic perception of many of Tzaitl's children thus included the very concept of an, of, of an historic homeland as a space in which the preferential rights enjoyed by the members of a nation defined as indigenous and, his, and historic are not subject to dispute. In other words, even though Seattle's children had no national republic within the borders of the Soviet state, at the level of their consciousness, which included, as mentioned, the component of Jewish national cultural identity, a basic infrastructure for the establishment of the 16th Jewish Republic had def <coughs> definitely been prepared. Some of them found such a republic, or more precisely their own Soviet successor state, in the state of Israel of the 1990s. Indeed, many of Tzaitl's uh, descendants who immigrated to Israel over the past decade and a half and certainly the majority of their newspapers and political leaders have no difficult, difficulty in recognizing the similarities between the Soviet nationality policies and the ethnocratic Israeli regime with regard to the superior, superiority of the historic indigenous nation according to the official myth, i.e. the Jews, or the non-indigenous nation according to the same myth, i.e. 
the Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel. From this stems the proclaimed, proclaimed support of most of the institution of the Russian-speaking community in Israel for the principle of the primordial bond between the Jewish nation and its, its exclusive territorial property and for the practice of the discrimination against national, the national Palestinian minority. And from this also stems the intense preoccupation on the part of the Israeli-Russian press with the exposing the historical truth regarding the non-indigenous of the Palestinians, striving to prove that the great majority of them invaded the Jewish homeland after, after the beginning of Zionism, and that their very presence in the land of Israel is an historical mishap that should be, that should be undone. This often, this often accompanied by blatant incitement directed towards Muslims in general and the Palestinian citizens of Israel in particular. And this is also the origin of the unique political manifesto of Avigdor Lieberman and his Our Home Israel Party, which unlike all the other Israeli Zionist parties, including the traditional extreme right, places the main emphasis on the so-called Israeli Arab problem rather than on the conflict with the Palestinians across the Green Line and demands of the Palestinian citizens of Israel and their leadership a public declaration of loyalty to the Jewish nation state, which means recognition of the Jew Jewish nation's primordial historic right to exclusive ownership of our home Israel. This integration of many of Tzaytel's children into the center of the <coughs> ethnocratic Israeli discourse by no means involves turning their back on their Russian cultural affinity. Contrary to Flosskin's contention, there is no question of publicly, of publicly understating the component of Russian culture either. On the contrary, their commitment to strengthening the ethnocratic characteristics of the Israeli regime is frequently, is frequently pre presented in the Russian-Israeli press as part of the Russian self-image which includes considerable, considerable experience and high expertise in the field of national problems acquired in the country of origin. This is to say that the Jewishness versus non-Jewishness dichotomy fails to hold water also with regard to Russian Israel. We cannot therefore agree with one of Slotkin's conclusions that the Russian part of the Jewish century is over at least as far as the Soviet successor state in the Middle East is concerned. We are witnessing the beginning of a new <coughs> chapter. And it would be seen that an understanding of the sequel chapter of, of, of this sequel chapter of Russian Soviet Jewish history necessitates not only a rereading of the previous chapters, but also actually the writing of entire chapters of the social, cultural and everyday life history of the Jews of the Soviet Union that have yet to be written, and in particular chapters relating to the history of the lives of Tzaytel's children. Well, t uh, Tamar's talk was itself a poem, of course, <coughs> and so I'm even more hesitant to comment on the poetic qualities of her presentation than she was in commenting on mine. She was, of course, very insightful in pointing out the contradiction between the totalizing way I deal with the Israeli and U.S. experience, or near total, and the uh, numerous parentheses and qualifications when it comes to the central story. As I said yesterday, and I don't mind repeating, and as I argue in the book, the book is indeed about, about Hodu. Uh, the other two are uh, counterpoints. Uh, I could say that saying that the Soviet journey was about a search for a land with neither capitalism nor tribalism, or so it seemed, I could say that the so it seemed part was an oversight, and maybe the editor should have bought it. Because, of course, the other two, the perfect liberalism in the United States, only seemed to be perfect, and the perfect ethnic nationalism in Israel only seemed or seems to be perfect. Um, 
on the other hand, I could defend the, the parentheses and say that there was a particular illusory quality to the Soviet uh, journey, to the search for a land without capitalism and a land without tribalism because it turned out, and I would argue would have been clear at the outset, that uh, a world without tribalism cannot exist. Uh, and one could also argue that in the modern world, life without capitalism is hard to imagine. Uh, so there was a peculiar quality to the Soviet pilgrimage that made it, made it tragic in the most basic uh, sort of Greek sense of the term. The tragic fault was there to begin with. Uh, and what we, what we see is the inevitable unfolding uh, of the story leading to the ultimate death of the main character, in this case, the, the central idea. Uh, the quotation that Tamar ended with, the one about the, the centrality of the family to, to human life and the centrality of family rhetoric to all <coughs> of politics, uh, is I would, uh, Tamar characterized that uh, passage as tragic, and I would take issue with that because uh, if we agree on what tragedy is, uh, what is truly tragic is an attempt to deny that obvious, obvious fact. And the story of Hodel is a tragic illustration of that, of that hopeless, quixotic rebellion. Uh, whereas an attempt to live uh, with the assumption that one cannot get away from the world of discrimination that the family breeds every, every day, every minute, uh, is not, not tragic. It's interesting. I mean, if you look at Marxism as a form of religion, uh, and actually Egal and I had an interesting conversation about that, one of the things that I, I think are striking as one compares Marxism and Christianity, for example, is how Christianity, which seemed at the outset to rebel against the family, makes its peace with it and includes, the, includes marriage as a religious sacrament, whereas Marxism, uh, or at least its uh, Soviet version, proves unable uh, to do that, unable to even understand how important rites of passage are to human life, so that there are no Bolshevik answers to how people are supposed to celebrate the birth of their children, uh, the wedding uh, of their children, uh, and then the death, um, their own deaths and those of their elders. So uh, anyway, so this is the only, the only thing I would uh, take issue with. Uh, otherwise, I can only say that I greatly enjoyed your poem. Um, um, as for Dmitri's comments, uh, I agree with much of what you had to say. Uh, I certainly don't do Seitel's story the justice it deserves. I am not sure that I am as uh, keen on maintaining the assimilation nationalism dichotomy, as you claim I am. Uh, the story that I describe is not really about an all-out assimilation. Most of my characters thought that they could be Jewish and Soviet and Russian at the same time. In the Soviet period in particular, that is not as true of the imperial period. They thought of the Russian language and Russian culture as the language of universalism. So it wasn't, they, I think many of them, thought that they weren't just assimilating to the Russian nation and Russian culture, that they were learning the language of the revolution, and that one could at the same time speak the language of Pushkin, 
the language of socialist revolution and be tribally, ethnically Jewish. Uh, the latter fact being, of course, proclaimed uh, starting in the mid-1930s in their passports. Now, whether Zeitl was murdered in the Holocaust, again, going back to the literary nature of the, of the narrative, uh, I think it's the author's privilege to decide who dies when, right? <laughs> it is probably the main, the, one of the most cherished privileges of any author is to decide whom to kill off at what point. I did so because it was important, and of course these are metaphors, as Tamar pointed out. It was important to me for characters that become metaphors and metaphors that are embodied as, as characters, but it was very important to me to have one hill as well as the three three promised lands. And of course, so many titles died uh, in the Holocaust. With regard to the difference between if we keep her alive or we look at her prior to, to the war and the destruction of so many, um, I think it is you're justified in emphasizing the difference between Hodel and Seitel, and after all, I do keep these two these two different characters. But I wouldn't stress it too, too much, the difference, I mean. Because those, and it's about, depends again on how you count and what you consider a city, but let's say that about one half of the original inhabitants of the Pale of Settlement emigrated and ended up outside the, the former Pale. And so we look at those who remained, and if we, again, if we subtract those who ended up in the big cities, in the old pale, they, they, it's, a, it's a smaller smaller population. Compared to their neighbors, they still, I think, are fairly described by the story that I try to tell. They were much more educated than their Ukrainian Belarusian neighbors. They were much better represented in the state and party apparatus early on before the, before the Soviet state <coughs> embarked on specific anti-Jewish discrimination. There were more proportionately Jews in the party. There were a lot more, and Ukrainian statistics, Belarusian statistics confirm it, I think, very eloquently that there was really no contest. In other words, Seitel's children who remained in the shtetl or in what used to be shtetlich did incomparably better than their non-Jewish neighbors. And so the basic paradigm, the story of the Jewish success, I think applies to them as much as it does to, the, to, to Hodel's children. That difference may be useful for certain purposes. It was useful to me primarily so that the Holocaust remained a part of the narrative. Um, and, uh, but with regard to the basic criteria that are important to me, I don't think that the difference is all that great. Speaking of the preservation, and again, I must say that, you know, you have, and this has been one very common reaction to the book, is, you know, this is your grandmother, and now let me tell you about my grandmother. And of course, there are at least twice as many grandmothers as there are of us, right? And so everyone has at least two grandmothers. Uh, but just for the record, my grandmother, and I choose to tell the story of Hodel, and I, again, I don't think that the difference is all that great, because I choose to tell that story, because it is, for those of you who were here yesterday, because it grew, up, or grew out of a study of the Soviet elite and the history of a particular building where some of the most prominent members of that elite resided. My grandmother certainly never lived in that building. She never went to school. Um, she was a seamstress and a night shift nanny in a kindergarten. Um, and she lived in, a, in an eight square meter uh, room in a communal apartment with her two daughters and for a, for a time was also with her nephew when he came to Moscow from Biribijan. So again, is she Seitel's daughter? Is she Hodel's daughter? For most purposes, the things that I think Dmitry mentioned, I don't think it makes, it makes much difference. With regard to the preservation of Jewishness, 
I think you're right that perhaps I should have said a bit more about some Jews somewhere, primarily in the former Pale, who did preserve secretly or not so secretly some elements of what used to be the traditional diaspora Jewish, Jewish culture uh, before the revolution. But I think it's so minor, so insignificant, it has to be negligible. Again, and this is going back to Tamar's point, of course I generalize a great deal. Of course I tend to talk about the, the big story of particular characters. And of course there is so much subtlety that doesn't get included, so much nuance, so many footnotes and sidetracks and so on and so forth, and other paths taken or not taken. But my best argument would be look around you in Israel today. How I, in it you judge how much of the diaspora traditional Jewish culture, the people who arrived in Israel, about what, a million, over a million people? How many, and most of them are not from Moscow and Petersburg. Certainly most of them are not from the house of government that I am now trying to write a history of. Most of them are from Ukraine, from Belarus, from big cities, from not so big cities, from the great Jewish city of Odessa that was associated with Jewishness all through the Soviet period. Uh, you tell me what traces, important traces of the Jewish, of Jewish traditional Jewish religion, Jewish culture, Jewish ritual, you see them observe or remember. And I rest my case. Um, there were was, there was some other interesting questions raised. Um, speaking of the Soviet nationality <coughs> policy and the degree to which it prepared uh, the Soviet Jews who came here for Israeli life, or indeed prepared them somehow for, for Zionism. I think it's an interesting idea, and I, I agree with it to some extent. Um, the one qualification I would introduce is if you look at some of the same people who ended up in the United States. And by the way, when you say that these people were prepared for their emigration to Israel by, by their perception that nations should have a home, I think it's true to, to, to a great degree. On the other hand, if not for the policy of the Israeli state, my impression is from what I know, and maybe Larissa knows better, a lot more Jews would have ended up in the United States had they not been prevented from doing so. So you could say that, well, there may, the United States may also be a Jewish home, but it does change the argument somewhat. In other words, it's not a foregone conclusion or it's not more likely or somehow more natural that they, that they would be propelled toward Israel because so many, and particularly the great wave, you know, there were the ideologues, there were the convinced Zionists, early on, but of course when the time came for the largest wave of former Soviets uh, for them to emigrate, they really had no choice. They had to go to Israel, most of them, and this is the, this is the story, and this is a part of the story that, that has to do with the relations between the Israeli state and the, and the United States. Uh, it became very, very difficult, much more difficult to, to uh, uh, to go to the United States. But be that as it may, uh, those or the cousins or the siblings of those who ended up in Israel, who did end up in the United States, seem to have been just as well prepared by the Soviet nationality policy somehow to accept the American way of being Jewish. So I do not observe much resistance on the part of some of the same immigrants from Chernovtsi, Odessa, Kiev, Moscow, Leningrad, and so on, who live uh, in the Bay Area where I, where I live, who accept as more or less natural the American way of being Jewish. So many of them. Again, not everyone, and there is nuance, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of um, qualifications that can be added. But uh, I wonder... Uh, because obviously the American way of being Jewish is very is very different 
right, the role of reform, reformed religion, and all sorts of other things we could we could talk about. And if you listen to to uh, Russian language radio radio stations in San Francisco, if you if you read local local newspapers, the alacrity with which most of these people accept the sort of the American Jewish rhetoric is remarkable. Uh, and so one wonders, it just, again, I take your point and I, I think it's overall convincing, but the naturalness of the Israeli outcome may seem less natural if one looks at the, at the American experience. Um, just a second. Uh, Ah, about, and finally, I should conclude, taken enough of your time, um, about the, the Russian chapter in the Jewish story of the 20th century being over, be, not being over, because it's being written in Israel today. Um, that may be, I really don't know, except that the point of having those different journeys, different pilgrimages, was that they really stood for something different. And when I say that the Russian chapter in Jewish history is over, I'm not saying that there are no Jews left in Russia, or that they don't have dilemmas to deal with, not all of which are about assimilation versus nationalism necessarily. Uh, but but what, I, what I try to say in the book is that Russia as a peculiar way for Jews to be, as to be Jews or perhaps stop being Jews, but one way to face the Jewish predicament of the 20th century, that Russia is no longer there, right? It's not any different from any other state where Jews are a, a minority, and one can again argue Russia may be seen as a nation state, as an empire, but either way, that chapter is no longer unique, and so the way I conceived of it it's over. Now, whether, the, whether the, the Russian Jewish experience in Israel constitutes a peculiar chapter, a truly new way for Russian Jews to be Jews or to be Russians or whatever, is for you to tell me because I, 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 I don't know. My assumption was that it wasn't all that different, really, but maybe it is. So thank you. Thank you very much for very interesting comments. Just one point. Hey. Uh, <laughs> to make it clear. I didn't claim that the Soviet nationality, nationality policies caused uh, the, Im the immigration, the wave of immigration, or, 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 or strengthened the, 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 uh, the Jewish uh, uh, the, the Jewish striving to to to, uh, to make Aliyah. I just uh, talked about. Uh, that the concept, the tools, the mm -hmm. concepts already were there. Right. Okay? So right. you... Yeah, I, I accept it. Okay, that's fair. All right. All right. That, that, I, that's fair. Uh, this is, this make, makes a difference. That's, well, again, just one, one uh, s uh, brief comment that I don't think that very many Soviets be they Jews, maybe Jews in particular, Russians, uh, Ukrainians, or, there, or others, had to be convinced that ethnicity is about, is about belonging to a particular place and to a particular tribe. So it reinforced something that had been there for, for a long time. Very interesting uh, evening. Um, regarding this kind of, uh, I don't know if it's a debate, or oh, it's only diversity, what we have here. About, uh, maybe it's a view from Moscow and a view from Ukraine. Although I'm not sure if it's Ukraine or somewhere in, uh, I don't know, in uh, Transnisteria or somewhere really more remote. No, I'm not sure this is uh, most of Kiev and Jews. But still, there are differences here. Now, regarding these differences, I think I'm asking your comments about the relations between your work now 
this paradigmatic uh, article that Julia uh, recalled before about the, the ethnic uh, system in the, in the Soviet Union. And my, my comment here uh, regarding both views, uh, Dimitri's views and, and your view, both of you mainly relate to the state and to Russian culture. When you relate to other actors, <coughs> well, you say Jews were more successful. But I think it's also important to look on the relations between Jews and other people, especially in uh, Dimitri's case. And I'm not sure that what made uh, this uh, Jewishness that you are talking about was this uh, passing Hasidic songs, or maybe the very sensitive relations between majority Ukrainians, for example, and uh, uh, Jews who were at the same time agents of uh, Russification, in many cases. And also, if we are taking uh, new forms of Mercurianism, I think that in many, in the periphery of the Soviet Union, you can see that Jews were very active in, let's say, transforming the new, uh, the, the new uh, cultural, uh, national cultures, Azerbaijani or uh, Uzbekistani and so on. Now, the, when they were doing it, I don't think that they were regarded by the locals simply as you are describing their relations with the power system or with the Russians. Uh, they were Russians, but at the same time they were Jews. And this kind of duality were quite important in these uh, relations. This is my comment, but I will be happy to hear your, um, uh, your idea about these relations. And I'm re um, relating both to your work, but also to the new work of Hirsch, which I think is quite important here. Uh, well, I think, as you said, I agree that they tended to be, in places like Uzbekistan and Azerbaijan, they tended to be the agents of Russification. Now, whether the, how many of the, uh, of the locals made the distinction between them and ethnic Russians, I don't know. In some contexts, I suspect that distinction was meaningful. In others, it was not. Uh, just as you know, some of the leaders of the pro-Russian movement at the time of Latvian independence, for example, were Russian-speaking Jews. And so eventually the fact that so many of the Russians there were Jews <laughs> led to the increasing use of the term Russian speakers as opposed to Russians. Now, whether it made the, the difference otherwise, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Uh, presumably, it, or I can guess that it might have, but I, I don't know for certain. Um, with regard to success, again, I'm not sure what, you're, what you meant to ask. But, I'm not uh, asking, I'm saying that you're relating to them only comparatively, but you don't look at their relations boundaries. And I, my claim is that this is a way to somehow negotiate the two, uh, the two claims that we have here, uh -huh. uh, Dimitris and, and you, because I think they were this kind of identities, uh, this kind of relations, ethnic relations and boundaries, explained how they were in a way um, more similar to your description as agents of crucifixion and not so much as, I must say, a bit uh, romanticizing this kind of Jewish heritage that uh, uh, I'm sure existed. But I don't <coughs> think that it was so important as you described it, Dimitri. And on the other hand, I'm quite sure that most of local, locals did um, uh, differentiate between Russian Russians and Russian Jews who act as agents of crucifications and, and use it. Although in some cases they were more Russians than, the Russians. than us. Okay. May I respond to it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, 
uh, you know, uh, I deliberately focused on the uh, content, on the hidden content of Jewishness, because this is actually the, the hard work to be done. It is, you know, it entails uh, uh, making a lot of work, uh, uh, going to archives, uh, 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 to collect materials. It is, it is, this is what is to be done in the field of, uh, to my opinion, in the field of uh, uh, Russian, uh, Soviet history, and it is, uh, you know, what would yes. you be looking for in the archives in this, in this, in this case? Just first of all, we should uh, we should map archives. We should, uh, you know, the, the uh, for example, to look uh, to look for the networks of, of what I call the what I termed networks, uh, so informal social networks, to 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 uh, uh, to join it uh, uh, together with uh, to combine it with, with interviews. You know, it's a lot of work to do. To, to and this is, and this is, I think, is, is, is crucial to, to be uh, promoted in the field. And that's exactly, you know, it's, it's, I think this is the easy part to... Uh, everybody, uh, everybody know, uh, everybody is familiar, I think, with the, the, with the claim that the, the, the axioma, the, that the, uh, uh, Russian, uh, the Soviet Jewishness were defined from outside, you know. So I wouldn't, I'm not interested in, in you know, in, uh, in recapturing this. Uh, uh, uh. His comment about the uh, differential ways of Russian Jewish immigrants' adjustment to the new places of residence uh, in Israel and in America because those were the two main destination countries of the post-communist wave of immigration. And as you pointed out, of course, the arrival of this huge mass of former Soviets to Israel was, uh, to a big part, explained by the lack of the Western option, which was closed in, in those days. But um, the way of acculturation of Russian Jews in Israel is very different from that uh, in the American context. Because in Israel, Russians, Russian speakers, make a point of being different. They very much want to manifest their difference, the cultural continu continuity. They keep speaking Russian. They develop their own subculture and you know, media and networks and institutions and schools and whatnot. And they make a point of transferring this capital to their children as well. While in America, the uh, um, voluntary adoption of the American Jewish rhetoric um, is a way uh, to join the mainstream America for Russian Jews. It's a very comfortable venue for uh, becoming American because Russian Jews in America very much want to become American. And Russian Jews in Israel do not want to become American. They want to become Jews here. Yeah. Yeah. They want to become Jews, so they won't live in America. Yeah, probably. Yeah, you know, being buying into the American reform and conservative version of Judaism, which is so much more lenient and you know much less obliging in terms of lifestyle and demands that it places on people, vis-à-vis -vis the very strict distinction between being orthodox and being secular in Israel, because there is no mid-option, in fact. And of course, most Russian Jews who grew up in a secular culture, they become seculars and not religious people. In America, it's a very easy way to become proper Americans because in America, you have to belong somewhere. You have to belong to some kind of community. <coughs> and reform and conservative communities are very comfortable to belong to. Uh, one of them about so-called Russian immigration here. Uh, one of them that they become Russians here, they undergo identity change. They're, they're not Russians over there. There were all kinds of people, but they become Russians in inverted commas. It's a new identity. It has some interesting things. Some of them learning Russian here. Become a very bad Russian, and the Russian is improving, as a matter of fact. And only f further of them, actually, from Russia. And, uh, 
uh, restaurant from Ukraine in other part of the empire didn't prevent Putin claiming that there's a million of Nazi statistics <laughs> uh, our competitors here. But that's another story. The other comment is that it's something came in other debates about your book in other venues. Uh, it's in response to uh, Shumsky comment about, and, uh, you said the Soviet Jews came here, uh, and some fairly assumption, fairly simulated ones, but the truth is it was much more heterogeneous uh, bunch of people from the western end of the Soviet Union, from those which were incorporated in 1939, they were fairly Jewish, uh, coming from the Baltics, you know, talking my own family, versus people who came from Moscow and St. Petersburg or Leningrad at that time, who were extremely Soviet. To give you a small this funny example, in my first Yom Kippur in Israel, I was invited to a festive dinner on Yom Kippur because it was a Russian thing, and you have a festive holiday, so you have to eat. Uh, it was Yom Kippur, it was a minor problem. Uh, but for other people who had a very strong sense of identity, Jewish identity, but it was much stronger in the Soviet experience of from the 40s to the 70s didn't change that. So you shouldn't uh, think that we're all of the same cloth. Yeah. I'd like to explore, uh, Yuri, your uh, notion of power. I mean, it's, it's, it's missing, um, I think, from the discussion, uh, and uh, this is uh, something that's been discussed greatly in the last uh, few decades, how you know, power determines truth, and part of the highest of all truth is identity. And in that respect, you know, the desire for the apollonial is the desire for power, or to belong to power. And this, uh, to some extent, explains all the different trajectories, I think, that, that you describe so well. Um, because nomadism, as successful, or perhaps not always so successful as you describe, it was a, a matter of weakness. It's uh, what Chomsky talks about, the uh, easy uh, flow of uh, Russian into Zionist nationalism, is their uh, immediate connection to power. And it's not only that they wanted to emigrate, the state wanted them here. So, uh, it was a, a very mutual uh, uh, coalition over this. So we, we can look at different fields of power, different hegemonies that uh, uh, the Jews uh, quite, I would say, predictably uh, would follow into uh, their uh, umbrellas. So in that respect, um, perhaps the end of the Soviet project is perhaps the end of Judaism. To see it. Uh, when Jews emerge into powers that are stationary, colonial, they are unilingual around the world, they are quite stationary, despite the age of globalization, they become more and more concentrated in maybe two or three or four centers, set two. Um, is the 21st century the end of Judaism? <coughs> Just a bit of speculative. You know, when Jews merge with power, that is the end of the Zion Decree of being Jewish. Uh, so it's not, not the problem is not so much Jewish, Judaism as Jewishness, right? Yes, Jewishness is a separate way of being. Well, good argument could be made, I think, that way. Uh, Power, again, power, there can be power, because when you say well, Apollonianism is about power, of course the same thing could be said about materialism, right? It's a different kind of power, and they can be perceived in different ways, but still each one has a power component to it, right? It can be magnified. Uh, now, whether association with power in and of itself results in the uh, extinction of Jewishness, uh, I'm not so sure. Well, if Israel is one example, right, uh, then it, the answer, I suppose, would be yes if you think of Jewishness in Mercurian uh, uh, terms. Although you yourself uh, suggested that the settlers could be viewed as, in some sense, Mercurians, right, because they strive to be Apollonians, and yet, in order to do that, they have to move. <coughs> so one could say that one, and perhaps Jews in particular, cannot truly uh, escape their Mercurianism. But it is interesting that in the United States, especially, when Jews become 
monolingual, they become sort of quintessential doctors and lawyers, but there are others who may be almost as good as being, as being doctors and lawyers. And what does that mean if the one language that they speak over there also happens to be the international language, right, the global, the global language? Is this power, yes, is this power in some ways, are Jews more connected or better connected to that power than others? I would say yes in many cases. Uh, does that lead to the extinction of their Jewishness? Well, I'm not so sure. 